Before we kick off the show, if you're a fan of History Hack, please do what you can to support the show. We completely get that not everyone is able or willing to dig into their pockets. Times are hard, but by dropping a like, subscribing on Twitter and YouTube, and importantly, leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts, you can help the program grow and reach more people. If you're interested in becoming a supporter, go to patreon.com forward slash history hack, where you'll find perks from secret Facebook groups to early release material. If you just want to leave us a one-off tip, go to co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description. And whatever form your kind support takes, know that we are massively grateful. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Zach here with Mrs. White. Charlie's joining me yet again. And Charlie's gone proper hardcore today because the day we're recording this is actually her birthday. So happy birthday, Mrs. White. Thank How you. How are you very doing? Much. Very good. I'm good. I am well ahead on birthday duties. I've had cake, a fish finger sandwich. I've watched some like it hot. I'm good to go. I'm ready, ready to get into some history. You are so rock and roll. Did you make your own cake? No, my mum did. The only person brave enough to bring me cake. Okay, fair enough. Let's move away from cake, shall we? Otherwise, we'll get into a, a very kind of deep <laughs> and... Uh, may, who knows? Maybe cake is embedded in our the story of what we're looking at today. But who so. are we talking to today? We have got Catherine Curzon here with us today. She's a royal historian who specialises in the Georgian period. She's also a writer most notably of the hit 2019 play, Being Mr. Wickham. And she's here today to talk to us about her latest book, which is all about the mistresses of George I and George II. Hello, Catherine. Hello, and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for bringing us this fascinating subject. I can think of no better way to spend a birthday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> so we're going to talk about two women today with epic nicknames. Now, George I's marriage before he reluctantly comes over to England to take the throne is a complete train wreck, I seem to understand. What happens to his wife to pave the way for the Maypole? Um, it, yeah, train wreck is putting it mildly. <laughs> uh, basically, he was married off to his cousin, um, and the whole reason behind that was to keep money and territory in the family. So no interloper could come along and start attacking this electorate. Um, makes sense. It does make sense. Um, and it was all further complicated by the fact that George's mum had originally been engaged to his wife's dad. <laughs> he passed her over to his brother because he didn't want to get married and it was all very confusing. But they agreed to this marriage, um, but George and Sophia Dorothea of Sell, his wife, couldn't have been more different. So George was this dour, glum young man, and his mum said he had a thick crust around his brain. <laughs> um, and all he wanted to do, basically, was be a soldier and go out hunting. But Sophia Dorothea had been raised like a princess in every respect. She was taken out in the streets in ribbons and silk and paraded and she was a real party girl and she was used to being the center of attention so when they came together it was just this horrific collision of two mismatched people um so George did his duty which is an awful way of putting it and they had you know the air um and then he took up with Melusine but Sophia Dorothea was absolutely devastated because she couldn't understand how you could replace her this glittering glam princess with somebody that we you know described as a maypole and a scarecrow <laughs> um, and when she challenged George he basically assaulted her and he tried to strangle her and he had to actually be dragged off of her and that typified quite a lot of the marriage there was a lot of violence from George to Sophia Dorothea um, so she eventually began an affair of her own which was with this dashing adventurous count called Philip Christoph von Königsmark who she'd been friends with in youth and he was what we would think of as a sort of quintessential romantic hero he had you know loads of thick rich hair and he was rich and he was always romancing different women and they eventually decided to run away together and it's almost operational 
in what happened next because one of his many old flames was also the mistress of George's dad. And she was so angry that he deserted her for this glamorous young woman that essentially she set up his murder. And on the night before the elopement, she had four assistants kill him. And he was never seen again. His body still hasn't been found. George had his wife locked up, the marriage dissolved, and basically she stayed under house arrest for 30 years until she died. And she was never allowed to see her kids again. So George left her in Hanover and came to England. Whoa. Quite a story. <laughs> what and is that, it with George? <laughs> I, I mean, God, hell of a way to start a podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, like murder, <laughs> nobody found the body and house arrest. Yeah. But what is it with the Georgians? Because Prinny, he mm. hated his wife with a passion he to did. the point where when Napoleon died, the messenger came in and said, sire, your, um, your worst enemy, or, or quite however they phrased it, has died. And he goes, what, my wife's dead? And he's going, <laughs> no, no, Napoleon, you know, the guy that for a quarter of a century we were fighting, he's dead. It, what is it with these people? They had a very strange setup. They either seem to hate their wives or depend on them to a slightly Freudian degree, like George II or, you know, George III and Charlotte, who were just this super provincial middle class couple who happened to be king and queen but yeah they 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 had very odd relations almost as odd as the relationships they had with their dads with their wives very strange i'm just i'm just taken aback by this (laughs) i can't can't even go to the next question zach i'm too shocked i wish that we were doing video for this because our faces (laughs) are just a genuine picture um right back into it so melissa you, you've introduced her to us, but tell us about who she fundamentally was and kind of how she ends up meeting George III. And, you know, what's the extent of their relationship? How how do we view it? Is it, actually, I'm not even going to start trying to pretend that I can put this all together. You talk us through it. You know, how, how does it all happen and where does it all go? Well, she was born to a minor noble family in Brandenburg. So they had a castle, but it was falling apart. It was one of those kind of noble families. Um, And very early in her life, her mum died. So she and her siblings became very tight and they stayed that way for all of her life. So they profited a lot from being her siblings. But as she was getting older, by which obviously I mean teenage, her dad decided that she needed either a position at court or a husband. And he was thinking, well, a position at court is a pretty good way to get a husband. So he took her to the courts of Hanover. Um, And the elector then was George I's dad, Ernest Augustus. And he had an idea that there she would find some good husband, you know, a noble husband. Um, And they installed her as the um, maid of honor to George's mother. And that's when George first set eyes on her. She was actually staying with um, Clara von Platen, who was the woman who engineered the murder of Mm -hmm. Sophia Dorothea's lover. So there was a whole feeling that it was some sort of conspiracy to get George away from his wife, but it really wasn't. It was that they were really perfectly suited. She was quite um, taciturn and she liked horse riding and hunting as well. And... I mean, people at court at the time said they were just both as boring as each other. But I don't know if that's actually fair. Um, But they obviously got along. They ended up having children together. Um, How their relationship was viewed, I mean, it lasted for, you know, decades. Um, And she was basically viewed as George's wife in anything but name. Um, But she was also blamed at the time, and I think this is, you know, a a woman through history thing, for basically every bad decision he made, she was blamed for it. And she was heckled in the street and she was called, you know, a whore and a harlot and all of this kind of thing. And I think now we view her more kindly and I think with a lot more balance, you know, there was a lot more at play than some scheming harlot, as she was called at the time time who was feathering her own nest so what do we know about what she was actually like and how do we how do we know about her well luckily for us 
visitors to the court in Hanover left a few fragments of memory about Melusine, but I think at the time, because she, obviously nobody knew what was going to come next, they didn't take too much notice of her. And because she was considered fairly unremarkable, she was just, if you like, the elector's son's mistress. Um, later in life, quite a lot was written about her, but it was usually by people who had a bit of an axe to grind. Um, but the picture that emerges, if we actually take the balanced view, um, is that she was actually pretty well liked, specifically because, although what came later changed that, she wasn't seen in Hanover as being political. She was just the domestic mistress, if you like, who soothed George's brow at the end of the day, but she didn't try to get involved. And this was a court that had a very involved mistress already in the shape of Clara, um, Electress Sophia was also a bit of a force to be reckoned with so there were already a, a couple of pretty strong women at the court and there wasn't really room for a third and um, we know physically what she was like simply because everybody again maybe this is a woman in history thing mm -hmm. falls over themselves to tell us that she was very tall and very skinny and very unfashionable um, that's how she got her nickname <laughs> Electra Sophia used to make fun of her and call this tall Morkin, which is obviously a scarecrow. Um, but as time passed, it began to emerge that she actually quietly had a huge amount of influence on George. Um, so we know you could apply to her for favours and titles. There was one particular duke who was later said to have bought his title with a length of ermine from the Duchess of Kendal. Um, but she wasn't what we would think of as a sort of showy royal mistress, although she was later criticised for being very greedy. But just as George wasn't a showy king, this was no George IV, they had this little domestic thing going on. And that's how she, is, if you like, solidified her position, that in a world where George was very aware of people trying to get favours and trying to empire build, she didn't seem to want to do that. She just wanted to, if you like, stand by her man and mop his fevered brow. So does she become more political over time? Mm. You know, I'm just thinking she goes to court and obviously, you know, nobody goes into that environment really knowing fully what to expect. You can't really prepare for court life. I don't personally think. I mean, Charlie, you may disagree, but, mm. uh, you know, you, you get dropped into that world and then you mm. start, if you're savvy, you start to observe the people around you and start to see and, and learn from their example. Is that kind of what happens to her? Yeah, it was. And it was particularly once she got to England and the British court where, you know, applying to fav for favours to a royal mistress was part of the course. Um, you know, there was a comment made that there's a it was a shop. Royal mistress has always had a shop for favours. And it's when she got to England, she very quickly began to learn the ropes. And she very quickly began to realise that people would come to her. And what she initially took, it seems, as just wanting some advice, or if you like wanting to quietly make a case, she soon began to realise that she actually had a part to play in this. And once she realised it, she was happy to embrace it. She's not so much like the second person we'll be talking about later. Um, she was very keen to build this little shop. And I think because she knew that if George predeceased her, she's on her own. Mm. You know, she she's not a wife. She has to get what she can get. And if you like, prepare this world for what's going to come after. So she was motivated by money to some degree. Um, and as I say, she was kind of later played off as being entirely motivated by money in terms of this sort of wild eyed grasping woman. But I think she was just very pragmatic and realistic about what life held for the mistress of a late king this is this isn't on on the list but i i don't know anything about her so i, I wanted to ask did she did she give him any children did they have children together yeah they had three um and they were all taken as um basically they were all raised by her um sisters and brothers so he said officially they were nieces mm. um but they lived at the royal court um and they lived there under the guise of being you know they're her nieces but she's generously taken them in to allow them to live at court but it was pretty much accepted that they were her children there was you know it was it was an open secret but George um although he didn't acknowledge them he treated them as his children so he never actually 
said, you know, these are my children. But he treated them as well as, if in some ways not better than his actual, actual legitimate children. It was a charmer like that. <laughs> so the Act of Settlement comes along. I guess we should probably clear up for our listeners what the Act of Settlement is, but then more kind of in line with what we're talking about today, what are the implications for Melusine? Um, it came along in 1701 and it basically ruled that no Roman Catholic could occupy the English and Irish thrones from that point on. Um, so that meant that dozens of Catholics who were way ahead of the Hanoverians in the line of succession were pushed out in favour of the Protestant Hanoverians. It brought them closer to the throne than they would ever have expected to get because Electress Sophia, George's mum, was Elizabeth Stuart's daughter. So she was, you know, bona fide British royalty. Um, but by the time Queen Anne was on the throne, the Hanoverians were right at the front of the queue next to her because if she didn't produce a living heir, Electra Sophia would be queen. And Sophia was decades older than Anne, but Anne, obviously, as we all know, had a terrible history when it came to pregnancies. And it looked unlikely that she would produce a living heir. Um, Sophia had never expected to be queen because of the disparity in age, and she actually was right, because she died just a few weeks ahead of Anne, which obviously made George the heir to the throne. But the ramifications for Melusine were huge. She'd been with George for a couple of decades by this point, and she knew on the death of Queen Anne that she would have to choose whether she stayed in Hanover um, or she would come to England, and she absolutely loved Hanover it was home you know she she loved it but she also knew that her nearest rival who was George's half-sister Sophia Charlotte whose nickname was the elephant oh, would do anything she could to get to England and become you know the, the the top of the court in terms of women because there was no queen there was no wife so Melusine at first basically refused to go and there's this story told that when she was told she would have to come to England she went into hysteria and she started running laps of the gardens at Heron House and embracing the statues and screaming but I think that's just a bit of hyperbole but she did stay behind at first hoping that Sophia Charlotte wouldn't be able to leave because Sophia Charlotte had enormous debts but Sophia Charlotte actually put on a disguise and fled Hanover by night for England and as soon as Melusine heard she literally packed everything bundled up the children gave chase and arrived just ahead of her arrival to make sure that she was the one sitting if you like at Georgia's right hand rather than this rather rudely nicknamed elephant oh my goodness so so when they do arrive in Britain what's Melusine's experience like of this absolutely I mean I'm guessing a complete seismic shift <laughs> in their lives between Hanover and and England yeah she, well she didn't want to be there and she didn't really make a secret of that but she was very much <laughs> okay. as I say, she was very much a stand by your man because she knew George hadn't been faithful and he never was faithful but she was I say like the de facto wife so he had other mistresses against his mistress which is you know, a spectacularly Georgian thing to do. Um, she wasn't allowed to attend the coronation because the advisors um, told George that it would be inflammatory. And he was later furious when he found out that some other former mistresses had been there. But at first, the thing that she focused on was building a domestic base. And George, who was not at all generous, actually spent huge amounts of money on building chambers for Melusine in Kensington Palace because he was determined that she would be happy because if she was happy, he knew that he would still have that person to come home to. But she was instantly looked down on by the fashionable English courtiers who considered that she was quite provincial and she was rather gauche. And there's a little moment where Lady de Lorraine summed up the prevailing mood when she complained that the newly arrived Germans weren't their sort of people. And she said, 
we show our quality, meaning the British, by our birth and titles, not by sticking out our bosoms. <laughs> and this is when people started to refer to the elephant and the maple, these derogatory nicknames. Um, and I opened the book with a quote from a newspaper in 1721 because it seemed to really sum up what she was up against. And it said, we are ruined by vexatious old ugly trolls meaning trollops and sadly that pretty much summed up what people thought of Melusine even as they paid tribute to her face because they wanted favours behind their hands they were just really rude and laughing at her it's a pretty unpleasant way to live really it is and yet she ends up being naturalised as a Brit doesn't she mm. why you know, it just doesn't, I mean, from, from what we've been listening to, you kind of think, well, she's not going to want to become British by any means. What's the reason behind the move? It was because she was desperate for a peerage and she wanted a British peerage. That was all that would do because socially it would put her, you know, alongside, if not higher than those people that laughed at her. It wouldn't matter whether she stuck out a bosom or a title or rank because officially she would be somebody and she knew that she was never going to be queen so this was the next best thing um she did receive an irish peerage at first and she was happy about it until someone told her it wasn't as good and then she was <laughs> absolutely furious and the guy who had arranged this peerage so he could get a bump up the court ladder ended up cast out by her you know because she saw this as an insult but by this point, by 1716, when she was naturalised, she was secure in terms of her domestic arrangement. She was happy for George to have other mistresses. She'd seen off plenty of serious rivals. So she didn't have to look over her shoulder in terms of that side of it. And she also had a lot of sway at court, but she was absolutely determined that the people that did laugh at her and mock her and say she was, you know, an upstart from Hanover, would essentially have to bow down because she would not just be the mistress, she would be titled. When she did get that period, she was Duchess of Kendal eventually, Robert Walpole wrote it off as payment for services rendered and he said of her that money was her principal and prevailing consideration and that she would have sold access to the king for any amount of money, which is quite current in a way. <laughs> Um, but again, it was this thing of being predeceased that having a title, having that little bit of rank, if he predeceased her, it just gave her a little bit more security in whatever world would come next. Gosh, I mean, you, you say it's it's relevant. It's also older than this. This is sounding a lot like the story of the Countess of Castlemaine, later Duchess of Cleveland, Barbara Villiers. Mm -hmm. You've got to get what you can yeah. while you hold the king and get what you can for your children so that you know you're good when the next monarch comes along. Exactly, exactly that. I, I feel for her. I feel mm. for her very deeply. Now, this is an interesting point with, um, with the, them as a couple. I, I understand that he could have married her in Hanover, but not in England. Is, is that right? Yeah, it's a bit of a funny one that because his marriage had been devolved in Hanover, the law in Hanover said he could remarry, but in England, he wasn't allowed to do it unless Sophia Dorothea was dead. Um, and George was very cautious of, well, he was cautious in some ways of anything that might upset the apple cart, but in other ways, he wasn't at all. But this one, he was absolutely set on the fact he wasn't getting married again um, because he just didn't want to attract you know, the, essentially the conversation that would come with it is, was she actually a queen? Was this a constitutional issue? And being a bit of a boorish kind of guy, he was almost of the kind of opinion of, why should I? You know, I've, I've got what I want. I've got my cake. I don't need to get <laughs> married. Um, there were lots of rumours of what, you know, a left-handed marriage or a secret marriage, but there's no solid evidence. Um, and quite a lot of weight has been put on something Robert Walpole said when he said she was as much Queen of England as anyone ever was. Mm. But I think that was more in terms of the influence and the access that there was. There's nothing solid to say they were ever married, and 
George never appeared to give any indication that he wanted to. And Melusine, as far as we know, because there's very little left that she actually wrote, um, we don't know what she, I'm sure she would have said yes, but I don't think she was asked. And what so, would that mean for the children? I mean, that, that's another constitutional issue, isn't it? If they have children and suddenly they're married, could they then be legitimised and put in the succession? Um, yeah, I don't messy. think they would have been. Well, they because they'd already essentially acknowledged them as nieces, mm. but I think they would get away with it. <laughs> they The children all did quite well out of it. They all received titles and, you know, they were, they were not, at the back of the queue when it came to getting handouts for access either um but i think yeah that george was very aware that you know he wasn't necessarily wanted in england at all you know the british people weren't that keen on having a king from hanover and i think to his opinion it was just one extra thing that was you know kind of a layer of complication <laughs> but a situation that was already a bit frenetic a bit yeah frenetic maybe didn't need so what becomes of melusine in, in the longer term what's how does it how does it end for her uh, Melusine stayed with George right up until the end. Um, George had been told many years earlier that he had to look after Sophia Dorothea, even after they were no longer married, because if he didn't, then it was prophesied that he would not survive her by a year. And when Sophia Dorothea fell ill in Alden House, where she was under house arrest, he sent the most expensive doctors in Hanover to tender, but she died. And legend at the time had it that she died cursing George their last words were a curse against him um meanwhile back in Britain Melusine who was very superstitious had a dream in which Sophia Dorothea's vengeful ghost visited her and said that she must be buried according to all privileges that she was allowed or essentially she would bring down a curse on the house of Hanover so Melusine told George what she dreamed and he agreed to give Sophia Dorothea a burial where she wanted it. And then they set off to Hanover. So they went on this trip. And at one point during the trip, just after they'd arrived, they were supposed to travel on um, to George's brother. Melusine stayed behind where they were resting because she was tired and George went on alone. Now, there's another legend here but as they were in the carriage, a black garbed rider with his face obscured thrust a letter into the carriage window at George that was another curse. So Sophia Dorothea was pretty keen on cursing him and that he opened the letter, read it and immediately had a massive stroke. Now, whether the letter part is true, we don't know, but we do know he did have a stroke. Um, he was taken on and essentially died before Melusine could arrive and she was absolutely bereft you know this was no convenient thing for her she really did care about this guy she'd been with him for 30 years you know and she stayed in Hanover for several months because she just couldn't stand the thought of coming back to England and all those memories when she did come back she retired into quite a reclusive life in this brand new Thames front estate, Kendall House. Um, but there's one last gothic twist in this tale. Mm. So Melusine, who was given to dreams of ghosts and you know, <laughs> vengeful wives, um, was sitting one night looking out of the Thames and remembering that George had said, you know, in one of his rare romantic moments, even death won't ever part us. And as she had this thought, an enormous black raven flew into the room and settled beside her and stories told from the time whether they're true or not I don't know with it from that day on she just kept the raven with her all the time she would sing to it at night people could hear her talking to it telling it about the day she's had just the same way she used to talk to George and Melusine apparently according to legend was sure that this raven um, had the spirit of George in it and when Melusine died in 1743, the raven was never seen again. And Horace Walpole loved that story. I don't know whether it's true. I kind of hope it is, because I like a bit of gothic melodrama. And I quite like the idea of George coming back as a curmudgeonly raven. <laughs>
Oh my goodness, this is straight out of Poe. I'm loving this. It is, isn't it? it is. Yeah. And I love that, you know, she's sitting there looking at the Thames, feeling a bit roof on this. And in my head, it's like ridiculously huge, this right? Of course, of course. Naturally. And that she, you know, she spends, what have you been up to today? Well, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Oh my goodness. So now we are, we're moving on to George part two, George the second. George, duh. Um, <laughs> George Harder. He he comes to the throne. Now he's literally been dragged to England, hasn't he? And it's safe to say that the father and the son didn't get along. No, they didn't. Um, they didn't get along at all because George the Second, George the Revenge. <laughs> oh my sorry. Oh he's um he basically blamed his dad for what happened to his mum and you know the fact that he never saw her again and that one day she was there and the next day she was gone and that he wasn't even allowed to speak her name he wasn't allowed to refer to her that uh, you know as far as the court was concerned Sophia Dorothea was she wasn't dead to them she didn't exist (laughs) and there's all sorts of stories about when he was you know a child that he he tried to swim the moat at Alden House and he took off on a horse and tried to get to his mum and he yeah he just couldn't stand his dad they couldn't have been more different but this as you know you can imagine you know, having yeah. your mum torn away from you just had a huge effect and he never forgave George the first and George the first I think as well was not the kind of guy who would put himself out to try and be forgiven so George the first arrived in Britain and immediately set about upsetting people by being grumpy. <laughs> um, but George the second was like the people's darling. He was, you know, he was he was determined to be seen as he wanted to be British, and he would always be talking about how much he loved everything about England and English people. And he would go out to the, you know, he would party and he would put out fires and basically be like a hero while George the <laughs> first sat at home grumping. <laughs> This is just mental. I mean, I'm still chuckling to myself <laughs> that Charlie's got described, um, got described George II as George Harder. This That's is brilliant. turning into classic <laughs> history hack right here. So we've had gothic like ravens. We've had failed murder attempts. So no, murder attempts where you can't find the body. Attempts to strangle people. This is... This, is, this all happened all as well, you know? This, this is what I'm struggling to get my head around. This this isn't some kind of cock and bull Hollywood blockbuster. This actually happened. So we've had the maypole. We've had the elephant. (laughs) We're now going to move on to, and I'm quoting here, this isn't me being a git, the peevish (laughs) beast. Who, uh, I mean, who who is the peevish beast, first of all, but more importantly, which misogynistic arsewipe decided (laughs) to call her the peevish beast? The peevish beast was Henrietta Hobart or Henrietta Howard, who became Countess of Suffolk, and she was mistress of George II. And although George II had lots of differences to his dad, they were very similar in some ways. And one of them was just being just a little bit grossly disrespectful of people. And when she had outlived her, I would say usefulness, when she had outlived her appeal to George II, he wanted to get rid of her and he called her a dull deaf peevish beast oh harsh. which is very very and it's particularly harsh coming from george ii who was an exceptionally peevish beast <laughs> <laughs> what can you say oh my goodness so tell us about how this peevish beast comes to marry into the the Howard family that's a Mm. a prestigious family to marry into nice it is yeah well it sounds nice but because this is a Georgian story (laughs) it doesn't end nice so when Henrietta was very young her father was killed in a duel and her mother also died when she was just in her teens but they left behind just a huge amount of debt and this vast house Blickling Hall that was falling apart But luckily for Henrietta, her step-great-grandmother was the Countess of Suffolk, so absolutely rolling in money and splendour. And the Suffolks took pity on the orphaned children. Um, And they essentially, they didn't quite go so far as taking them in, 
but they helped them out. And the Suffolks had this son that nobody wanted to marry, who oh. was called, well, no, Baron Hervey had said he was, let me get this, wrong-headed, ill-tempered, obstinate and drunk. <laughs> and they decided that Henrietta at 16 and already, to be fair, having, you know, had to go through things way beyond her years in terms of being essentially the head of this family. At 16, they said, why don't you marry our wonderful son? And she was a little bit bold over because she only saw him when he came for visits and he was this worldly successful man. And she agreed. And she, you know, as the quote paraphrasing said, something like thus they married and thus they hated each other for the rest of their days. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, he just sounds like perfect husband material, mm. doesn't he? What was it? Drunk? Um, Ill-tempered and obstinate. Yeah, ideal. Um, so... <laughs> The poor woman, she's this peevish beast is lumped with, from the sounds of it, another peevish beast. But George, he's gone on to marry Caroline of Ansbach. Mm. Is that right? So what's that marriage like? It was quite a successful one. <laughs> it's a rare successful one. Um, because George the first marriage had been a disaster, one of the things he thought might help would be if George the second actually had a bit more say in who he married. Mm. so they had this idea that Caroline of Ansbach who was an orphan who had been raised at George II's sister's court would be an excellent wife she was young and educated and apparently and this is where they got it really wrong she was unpolitical but they ah. got that completely wrong mm -hmm. so he said to George II why don't you go and meet her but go incognito so it's all a bit romantic fiction so he went under the assumed name of Monsieur de Bush. <laughs> and as Monsieur de Bush, he wooed Caroline. Um, and it wasn't until they fell in love that he revealed his true identity. Now, did she know? Probably she did know, to be honest. Mm. Um, but by that point, they were head over heels in love with each other. So um, they got married, basically. Mm. Um, and everybody had the idea that this was the sort of marriage that would be um, very domestic, you know, that there wouldn't be any problem. Um, but they got it wrong because Caroline was actually not this backseat. She'd actually been raised at a court with um, quite a strong female role model. She'd been tutored in philosophy. She essentially knew it was OK to know her own mind. And she turned out to be a consummate political wheeler dealer mm. and during George II's reign there was nobody he trusted more than her and he was incredibly shrewd she was incredibly shrewd sorry and she was basically a born politico and she was very very much a realist um, and just as Melusine was blamed for a lot of the bad decisions George I made Caroline quietly got the credit for a lot of the good decisions George II made and dodged the blame for the bad ones. Sounds pretty lucky. <laughs> um, that's, that, that's quite rare. That's very rare. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we've got Caroline, but we need to go over and talk about Henrietta again. Um, tell us about her, how her life changes, because I understand it's, it's not, not at all rosy for Henrietta. It was not at all rosy. He was, um, her husband, sorry, Charles Howard was absolutely horrendous. You know, we just heard all this about him being this obstinate drunk, but it went way beyond that. He was violent and essentially he kept her as a slave. Um, he had married her for money. He took her dowry, um, but he wasn't able to get hold of all of the money. There was a portion that was mm. held in trust um, for any children they had. And he did try to get it, but he was never able to. But every penny she had, he spent it on brothels and booze and gambling. And when she fell pregnant, he essentially moved her through progressively worse and worse homes until he stuck her outside London in a slum with a new baby and came back to the city to spend essentially what was her money. Mm. 
Um, he sold all of her possessions off. And when she was eventually evicted because she couldn't pay the rent, even on the slum, he dragged her around under an assumed name to escape his creditors. So she began to save up money um, that she hoped would fund a trip to Hanover because obviously this was now the court of the heirs to the throne and English ambitious British courtiers were heading over there to, if you like, sort of make their case. Um, but every time she saved some money up, he gambled it away. He then suggested that she should sell her hair um, and then mocked her because no wig maker would give her enough for it because she was in such a terrible state by this point. Um, but they did eventually save up enough money to go to Hanover. Um, and off they went. I think they thought the streets were going to be paved with gold. Um, but they didn't have a lot of money. So it was really important as soon as they arrived that they got their feet under the table straight away. Um, and Charles became an equerry to George. Um, and Henrietta became a lady to Electra Sophia, who absolutely loved her. And Electra Sophia was also very close to her daughter-in-law, Caroline of Ansbach. So Henrietta became a confidant of Caroline as well. Um, and that was when life changed for them. They essentially got themselves the guarantee of roles at the British court when George I became king. And from that point on, so long as they managed to get back to England very quickly, once the Hanoverians came, as far as Henrietta was concerned, for the first time, she would have some stability. And what's her role like in the kind of the Georgian courts? Is she kind of a, a particularly minor figure? Is she almost like a, a servant? Or how does she end up kind of getting involved in George Harder, as Charlie calls him? She was... Um something of a minor role because you know there were a lot of very ambitious and much more celebrated courtiers than her at the time um but it was Sophia who first realized that George II seemed to be taking a shine to her and she was quite sanguine about it you know she just said well it might improve his English <laughs> um but when they came back to Britain the Howards raced after them they were still only friends at this point George and Henrietta but it was soon after they came, they returned, they arrived, sorry, in Britain, that the relationship turned intimate. But George had actually been after one of Henrietta's friends, who was a much more celebrated court beauty and much more what we would think of, if you like, as royal mistress material. Um, but when she knocked him back because she had a secret fiancé, he switched his focus to Henrietta, who previously had been employed, if you like, as a kind of decoy that there would be three of them in the room so he could romance one mm. um it wasn't love but it was an arrangement that suited both of them so Henrietta from being quite a you know a, she was in the inner circle but she wasn't by any means standing out of it but then suddenly obviously she's the mistress to the new heir to the throne and she was kind of propelled into stardom from there so George's attitude starts to call towards her. Mm. What does she do and what, what becomes of her in the end? This just all sounds like a little bit of a bit of a sad, sad trajectory for her. Yeah, it was. Um, because she knew that she had to really hang on to um, she had to really hang on to George mm. because she had this husband who, you know, he's he's an equerry to George the first. He's he's as close to the throne as you can get. And that he's there all the time. So Henrietta had this position, but her salary, you know, her chambers, the first home she's had that was secure for a long time and protection came with staying in the royal favour. But when he called to her, he called to her very, very quickly. Mm. And she became yesterday's news. And we know early in the relationship, he would visit her for hours on end. And he was very, very punctual. And if he arrived five minutes early, he would pace him down, like desperate to go into the room. But then it became the case that it would become a chore for him to see her. And he would only go to see her to shout at her and bicker with her and complain about what was going on. Nice. But Caroline, 
was determined not to let Henrietta go from her staff because it was one of those better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Mm. And Henrietta was not, she wasn't an unknown quantity as a mistress. She wasn't super political. She just wanted her own security. Mm. Whereas Caroline's looking at all these sort of up and coming young would be royal mistresses and thinking, well, they could have ambition. Um, but Henrietta was tiring of court life. She was tiring of being, you know, the servant to Caroline and the servant to George as well, really. You treated her pretty badly. So she secretly had a house built, Marble Hill in Twickenham, which was overseen by all sorts of titled men who absolutely adored her. And then she had the good fortune to be widowed. And when she was widowed, she didn't need security anymore. You know, by now she's a countess she's got money of her own but when she asked George who she knew was tiring of her to release her from court essentially you referred her back to Caroline and Caroline said no you're staying and she played it off in you know a very manipulative way saying to her you don't know what life's like out there you want to stay here it's almost like saying stay here because at least you know how badly you'll be treated yeah. <laughs> but when George found out that Caroline had vetoed it that's where we get the peevish beast he went absolutely crazy screaming at Caroline about this old dull deaf peevish beast and he said why make her stay and plague me when I had so good an opportunity to be rid of her <laughs> and at that point Caroline knew that the jig was up um, she told Henrietta she'd like a week to think about it but before the week was up she let Henrietta go so she got her honourable retirement and one of the last things Caroline said to her when she left was, you know, this is the biggest mistake you'll ever make. You should stay. Um, but Henrietta said herself, I have been a slave for 20 years and I have a mind to take pleasure once in my life of my absolute power. And she went off and she just made the absolute best of being free, which I think is what we want. She got uh, a happy ending. <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm so glad. I was so worried for a moment there. Go. That is one of those. She's one of those when you're reading it, you're like, I just come on, be all right, be all right. <laughs> Good for her. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I was starting doing almost kind of jumping up and down cheering at the, <laughs> the point at which the, the git died. Um, <laughs> because my God, what an arsehole. Um, yeah, he was, he, he was, he would, he just wouldn't let it go. Um, and we've, there's actually a very long letter that Henrietta wrote to him in which she goes through piece by piece each part of the marriage vows that she made and essentially takes apart why he has released her from it. So, you know, that he took her money, he cheated on her, he made her have an assumed name. And mm. it's, such, it's such a well-reasoned argument. But even then he wouldn't let go. He would turn up in the palace grounds screaming and shouting and have to be removed. He even at one point pulled open the door of Queen Caroline's carriage and threw himself in and demanded that she turn this carriage around. <laughs> and Caroline was not one to be trifled with and apparently she absolutely raged at him. And she wrote her own letter saying, you know, I was really frightened, but no way was I doing a detail for him. So it's, it was nice. It was like this kind of like suddenly he collided with this incredibly strong queen who was like mm, no not on my watch Just, i mean that's yeah, a good way like to it. get yourself shot or stabbed <laughs> is you know mm. trying to throw yourself into the carriage of the queen you know, bodyguards yeah. failing quite substantially <laughs> there oh and, um, and obviously george the first was dead as well so he's all this protection he had from the king gone and i think he was such if you like such a narcissist i don't think he ever actually thought that there would be anything but the outcome that he wanted got that wrong <laughs> bizarre bizarre individual um as well as a complete asshole um yeah. we've we've had it all this episode haven't we we've had you know dark gothic tales we've had just disgusting examples of what men can be um but there's there's an important kind of point to all of this isn't there which is that there is mm. a legacy you argue in terms mm. of these women when it comes to royal mistresses. Talk us through what you feel that legacy is. I think, I mean, for me, that they are, obviously they're not the first or the last royal mistresses, but they really sort of changed between them the shape of the role. So Melusine was the last royal mistress 
or to live openly, if you like, as an unofficial consort to the king. So we did have very open relationships with mistresses afterwards, but she was, as we said, you know, the queen and everything, but having the ring on her finger. Um, she was very political, but in a kind of quite, in a way that benefited her, let's put it that way. Uh, whereas Henrietta was far less political and perceived as far less controversial. So she was essentially a domestic mistress. George III, you know, famously had no mistresses and George IV had barrow loads of them. <laughs> but none of them had this role that Melusine had. And I think Melusine's legacy was almost to say, you know, she was the last of that breed that breed of mistresses who were there almost as part of the furniture. Henrietta kind of kept herself back. And obviously we know that William IV and of course Queen Victoria kind of reset things after Prinny. After that, obviously Queen Victoria didn't have mistresses, but after that there was discre discretion. So to me, the Georgians was kind of the last run of the mistresses that didn't have discretion. And after that, your mistress wouldn't be living as a member of permanent staff. So I think they were the last gasps of what we would recognise as a kind of old school royal mistress. But that meant they were caught somewhere between servants and companions. And I think that's what makes them so fascinating because they had to play such a finely balanced game and you have to deal with wives and courtiers and kings. And it's a role that's often played off as being quite glamorous. You know, these rich women just kind of eating bonbons and wearing mm -hmm. silk. But it was a full time job and it wasn't necessarily a job that I think you would want. <laughs> it does. It does sound like a very much a double edged sword and the you know, great mm. power does attract a lot of enemies. Um, and, yeah, yeah, it does. And in some ways, you know, double when you're female, I think. Mm. Oh, mm. well, that's that's just perfect. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for telling us about these these remarkable women and um and these uh these dubious men today it's been really interesting if our listeners want to read more or know more um where can they do so they can come along and find me at katherinecurzon.com and there's all sorts of things there to go and have a look at fantastic thank you so much thank you hello folks zach again here as you know we love bringing you these podcasts but each episode has a huge investment of time behind it. For every hour of showtime, there's often a good four, five or six hours of work that's going in behind the scenes. We want to bring you more content, video content even, but as reality has hit and the need to earn a living has returned, we just haven't been able to do that. That's where you come in. Your support doesn't need to be financial. You can follow us on Twitter at hack underscore history. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube. Even simple likes, shares and retweets make a huge difference in widening our reach beyond the small army of you who tune in. And if you love the show, leave a review. If all our listeners were able to find the two minutes to do that, it would massively increase our reach. Of course, we totally get that times are hard and money is tight. If you can spare something and want to, there are different ways that you can help. If you want to become a regular supporter, check out patreon.com forward slash history hack. There are all kinds of perks across different levels of support with prices starting at £3 a month. If you just want to send us a one-off tip, then visit co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description to this episode. But importantly, also have a think about supporting our listeners. The hour they spend with us is a minuscule fraction of the time that they spend researching and writing their books. With that in mind, we set up the History Hack bookstore, where you can support both them and us, instead of funding Jeff Bezos' next trip into space, which is what pretty much happens when you buy via Amazon. Again, the link is in the description, and we have a huge back catalogue of titles written by our guests. When you buy via uk.bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash History Hack, we get a percentage, and so do independent booksellers. Whatever form your support takes, we massively appreciate it. So from Alex, Boney and me, and the rest of your down-the-pub regulars, thank you, and have a great day.